<clears throat> okay, great. So I was first introduced to Sabrina by my dear friend Kelly, who's joining us tonight. And she mentioned that Sabrina and her teammate Leanne are rowing across the Atlantic and they were looking for sponsors for their team, She Roars. When I researched about the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge and the She Roars website, I was absolutely gobsmacked at the incredible challenge that Sabrina and Leanne were going to be embarking on. At IO Fiber Water, it's important for us to support women and also supporting mental and physical well being. And so we said, sign us up and became sponsors to the She Roar teams, She Roars team. Uh, so this sponsorship's going to partially help Sabrina and Leanne buy their boat and raise funds for not only their journey as well as incredibly worthwhile charities that She Roars will be raising money for, which we'll share about in this presentation. So let's get started. As Sabrina lives in our area, I had the great opportunity of getting to know her better and found out that not only is she a Pilates instructor and a yoga instructor uh, about to embark on this incredible feat of crossing the Atlantic, she's an amazing global adventurer. So a few weeks ago when I was lying in bed, super tired, knowing I need to get up and go to the gym and thought, oh, I can't be bothered. And then I had this moment of, if Sabrina can row across the Atlantic, surely I can get up and go down a couple of blocks to the gym and for an hour. So that really led me to thinking, what drives Sabrina to push through pain and discomfort and hardships and just sheer mental and physical endurance and stamina must be so massive for her. So what can I learn from her? And then I thought perhaps maybe other people would also be interested to hear how Sabrina pushes through incredible obstacles to achieve huge successes in truly intense challenges, which has led us to this evening. Sabrina, can you share a bit about this incredible picture that we're looking at right now? Um, the picture that you see, I am at Everest Base Camp. Um, it took us two weeks to get there uh, <laughs> and yeah, it was probably my very first kind of big adventure um, after I guess arriving in Scotland. Um, you know, there's so many little stories to getting to the big picture there. Um, I could probably talk for hours. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit about it. Um, it was in 2007. Um, I was probably in the darkest place um, in a personal level myself um, because my marriage wasn't going so well. And I'd lost a big chunk of who I was. And I would say that challenge there, that point there was me out of that dark hole and kind of seeing the light again. Wow. And just obviously it was many obstacles to get there, but the actual physical and mental um, challenges, I'm sure that you must have hit a wall or many walls. And what, what drove you forward, or if you could remember, um, you know, when you were there, uh, any, any walls that you hit and what pushed you through? Um, well, interesting. I went to Nepal for the mountains because I grew up in the mountains in Canada. Um, and it was the Nepali people that I left loving. Um, so I would say the team that I was trekking with, they were a big part of that. Um, the Sherpas, they were amazing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a team effort. It was just never on my own. Hmm. Amazing. And, um, was there anything that made you stronger mentally during this incredible feat of endurance that you've used in other adventures and expeditions that you can recall? Um, I think overall, the biggest part of it was being in such a dark place personally within my own personal life and finishing the trek 
and actually seeing that I hadn't lost who I was as a person. Um, I was still there. I just needed to find myself again. And I was given three weeks of, you know, getting to the summit, well, not the summit, but to ever space camp and then back down again to self-reflect and realize I make the choices. And my choice was not to go back into what's the right word, maybe the toxic relationship that I was in. I was still staying in the relationship and I did up in for another nine years. Um, I just came out a, bit, a stronger person to be able to deal with maybe being like, you know what? No, this isn't good. This isn't good for me. And I kind of kind of stood up for myself once I got back from that trip. So oh. that started it all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Amazing. So this one is just incredible. Well, they're all incredible. Um, <laughs> obviously getting involved in such life-changing and indeed life-risking adventures and expeditions is not for the faint-hearted to say the least. Were you always into competitive sports as a child? Um, you, not competitive sport. So I was a really shy child, like unbearably shy. And I was introduced to sport at a young age, but competitive sport came a little bit later, um, probably nine, 10. Um, but yeah, it was sport that made me definitely more confident child. And was there a turning point in your life that made you push yourself athletically? Um, the turning point probably was in my junior ski racing years. So as a junior ski racer, um, you learn a lot about yourself and, you know, <laughs> um, that there's always somewhere to improve and whatnot, but you do get a lot of praise as well. So when you do well, and I think naturally I was lucky that sport came natural to me and that's where I ended up with a fair bit of praise and congratulations. So, you know, I always strive for the next bit and then learning the, the next new sport and yeah that, that's interesting and I hope you don't mind me mentioning this but when we were talking initially about this you were mentioning that um that there was bullying going on and and that that kind of um yeah so um it was probably more high school that I was dealing with a lot of bullying and it was the ski hill that was my safe place. You know, there was no judgment there. There was a different community of people around me. Um, and I think that's probably what pushed me forward to doing more adventure into my teens because I felt safe doing it. You know, you're on the ski oh. hill. I had all the freedom in the world and nobody judging me and nobody bullying me and making me feel little, you know, I finally got to feel like I could just be me. Freedom. Yeah. Free to be me. <laughs> you could be, you know, your, your true self. Yeah. yeah. Love, not lovely, but you know, at least you found that. And, and at yeah. 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 Age and that's, um, that's amazing. Uh, just getting back to this picture, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about it. And I was just curious if it was the hardest expedition you've been on. And, and well, what was the hardest expedition that you've been on and thought you didn't think, well, you might not be able to complete it? Um, well, the Arctic Challenge definitely presented us with the most challenge because I went with a team of seven other women. And it was a short challenge, so we were only gone for a week. Um, but, you know, from a physical point of view, we'd all trained extremely hard for two years building up to it. But the mental challenge, I don't think a lot of us were expecting. Um, at no point did we not think we'd finish the challenge. We thought we might have to do a different part of the challenge um, because the elements weren't always so kind to us. Um, so when you fight, 
a blizzard for nine hours, not able to stop, <laughs> hardly able to see the sled in front of you. You know, I was holding on to my sled for dear life for nine hours until we got to a cabin because we were meant to stop after five and set up tent, but it was so bad of a blizzard that the guides felt it wasn't safe. So we pushed on through for a further four more hours. Wow. Scary. That must be really scary. At the time, um, I have to giggle because through the first thing that was going through my head, the first kind of hour was, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> um, because it was a proper blizzard, you're like the stories behind this and you're kind of singing songs in your head and just getting on with it. You know, five hours in, you've not been able to eat or, you know, get water because you're too afraid to lose a glove and then your hands get to frostbite and all of that and then nine hours in you're like I just want to be done with this <laughs> I bet when you got to that cabin and crawled into a, a bed or wherever you were just that relief must have been huge well the worst bit about it was I'm not sure if you can see on there there's an anchor that sits on the side and my anchor had gotten caught one of the snow signs and the dogs pushed forward and I couldn't get them to reverse to unhook the anchor. Mm -hmm. So what this meant was everybody in the team had passed by me. And then I was at the end with the last kind of guide and the guides were only there to make sure we were safe. So by the time we'd gotten to the cabin, you have to stick the dogs out on a night line and you have to do it one at a time so they don't get tangled. So by the time we got to the cabin, I still had two hours to wait because I was the person at the back. So I was at the back waiting, <laughs> desperate for the loo, desperate for food and just to get warm. And I had to wait to the very end to get my dogs on the line last. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it. I did it, yes. <laughs> did, you, did you have coaches and it's experts that you worked with, not only with nutrition as well as motivational? Yes. Yeah. Um, even for that journey there, um, we worked with one of the uh, sports doctors that works with one of the Olympic teams um, out of Dundee. So he was actually really useful um, in preparing us for this. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just um, to, to, to share with everybody, and I didn't know this either, so were you in Scotland when you went? So where, where was the, what Arctic were you in? Like, was yeah. it uh, here? The, or... the Arctic there is the Scandinavian Arctic. Oh. So we went from Tromsø, Norway to Karuna, Sweden. Okay. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if it was in Canada. Well, above Canada. Canada. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> cool. Right. So you have traveled the world having incredible experiences and meeting new people as well as having obstacles and challenges. And I understand that your journey to India was not only phenomenal mentally and spiritually, but that you also experienced something not so pleasant as a result. Um, so not getting into the nitty gritty physical details, but perhaps you could share a bit more about your ongoing physical experience from your trip to India. Yeah, so my trip to India was, um, more a spiritual one for the side of yoga. Um, and somewhere along the way, while I was in India, um, I picked up a parasite. And I pronounced the parasite Girdia, which I could be pronouncing wrong. So apologies if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, but this parasite um, comes from contaminated water, um, which is easy to find in India. <laughs> um, and it affects the small intestine. And normally you would experience fever and vomiting. Um, and for some reason, for about three to four weeks, it must have just contained itself in my small intestine. And it wasn't until I got back to the UK that it decided to present itself. Um, so after three different types of antibiotics to try and treat it, it still didn't work. Um, so it took us a fair long time getting antibiotics and trying to get it to resolve itself in my system. Um, and then it created some other type of kind of <coughs> cysts in my system. 
Um, so for about a year after India, um, anytime I put dairy products into my system, it acted intolerant. And then even up until last summer, my system was still showing signs um, of the parasite. So I went on a strict kind of cocktail of supplements, which seemed to work. But what was happening was my system was still hostile, like it still wouldn't keep the good bacteria unless I was taking the probiotics. So, you know, I thought, well, this is me for life. I'm going to be stuck on supplements for the rest of my life just to have my digestive system feel as though it was going to work properly. Wow. So uh, I didn't catch that. So when, when was it 2017 that you went to India? When did you, when did you go to India? Yeah. So I went to India in 2017. Um, I got back in April of the 2017 um, and Preparing for this Atlantic challenge, we started working with some nutritionalists called Nature Doc. And part of this was doing full blood work, full digestive work because of my history. Um, so it was just last year that we discovered that I was still struggling with the signs of the, not the parasite specifically, just kind of a host of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Well, I understand that you recently had an incredible breakthrough though. Yes. Which we're very excited about. <laughs> it uh, is so would you be open to sharing that a bit more with us? Yeah. Um, so obviously Kelly connected us and um, I started taking the IO fiber water <laughs> and, you know, a bit of tummy bubbles and whatnot through it. And I think I was drinking the water. I must have been two months into it and I thought right my system's feeling great I need to find out where I am with the digestive system so I went to my own GP and we did um, another stool test and lo and behold because what happens is I stopped taking any of the supplements for three weeks prior to taking the stool test and my system was able to maintain itself so without the assistance of supplements Wow, that's huge. So it is huge. Um, I still feel like there's work to be done in my digestive system. So I'll continue with my, my daily fiber water and my supplements. But I think, you know, by the time I'm ready to row the Atlantic in 14 months time, that my system will be able to handle it on its own. That, that's amazing. And what a huge hurdle to, to overcome. Oh, 100%, you know. Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, yeah. So delighted with, with everybody, you know, because I honestly thought I was going to be reliant on supplements and probiotics for the rest of my life. And yeah, well, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> that, that, that in itself, you know, it's it. Well, as most of the people on here already know about the Glasgow Caledonia University study that was done, um, which proved that the water in itself actually significantly increased some um, probiotics, which are the friendly bacteria. So uh, just, we knew that, but to actually have somebody come forward with such incredible issues, and that was the only change that you had made, then, then we, you know, it's yay. That's yes, fantastic. definitely. That's that's, so thank you. I'm so delighted that that's made a difference for you. So just, just moving on, as mentioned in the ads for the event, uh, Sabrina and your teammate, uh, Leanne, are preparing to do what many of us would consider as being impossible. So I just thought that uh, at this stage, we'll uh, share about the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. So in 2023, Sabrina and Leanne will be rowing across the Atlantic nonstop, two hours on, two hours off for 3,000 miles, enduring waves of up to 40 feet, storms, physical and mental exhaustion, and much, much more. And just as a, a PS, Sabrina and Leanne have never rode before, let alone to this incredible magnitude. So approximately how many months are you going to be at sea? Um, so we're hoping to row it in 50 days. Um, 
the women's world record was met this year at 45 days. So we are pushing to try and meet that 45 days. Um, we do pack for 65 days though. So yeah, <laughs> I'd like to say 45, but I don't want to jinx the weather or anything. So I'm going to put it down the middle at 50. <laughs> well, we'll show you the boat shortly, but um, just, just about the adventure itself. And, and I just love this because it's about inspiring women and girls to step outside of the norm, to go on their own adventure and of discovery and reached for that previously unreachable goal. But it's also about raising money for three really amazing charities. So first of all, I was just gonna ask, how did you find out about the Talisker Whiskey Challenge? Um, well, the first thing that kind of planted the seed was I watched a documentary on four women rowing across the Pacific. So they went from California to Hawaii, Hawaii to Samoa, Samoa to Australia. So that planted the original kind of, oh, you can row an ocean kind of seed. And then I watched a documentary on James Cracknell and Ben Fogel. Um, so they did the Atlantic Challenge. At that time, I think... Woodvale still owned the rights to the race. So you start researching it and you're like, do they still have a race running? Is it every two years? To find out it was now run by Talisker Whiskey um, and, the, and Atlantic Campaigns. And every year they run it. And wow. all you needed to do was prepare and you know, away you go. And I was like, I could do this. <laughs> this is the next challenge. Um, and then you know, COVID happened. I ended up in Canada staying with my brother and family just because I needed to be doing something and I can help them. Um, and I was helping my brother prepare for an Ironman. So we'd gotten out the big charts and we were looking at, you know, when he was needing to cycle, when he was needing to run, when he was needing to swim, what kind of nutrition he should be sticking in his body and, you know, the proper clothing for something like an Ironman. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you're going to do an Ironman. I'm going to row the Atlantic. And he just looked at me. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing you know, here I am. And that just kind of set it in motion. So that comment and kind of a little bit of sibling rivalry, sibling rivalry, put it in motion. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And so I guess that, that was my next question. What was the trigger that made you decide you just needed to do that? Yeah, yeah, it, it was, you know, spending time with family and realizing, oh, when was the last challenge? When was the last challenge I was on? And it was India in 2017. And Sarah has also joined us tonight. So Sarah has actually been to India. We met in India at the end of my trip. It was the beginning of hers. She's ventured to Panama with me. We did the Great Wall of China trek together. So hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. And she's, a, and she's a fellow Canuck too, right? No. No, no. I'm not. Scottish. Live oh, in London, but I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying listening in to everything, Sabrina. Well done. <laughs> ah, great. So uh, just to talk about the boat, which we're going to see a picture of in a second. So I understand that the boat alone costs £70,000 and you're in the final stages of raising that last bit of money. And, but, and until you do, you haven't even picked the boat up yet, of course. So um, I'm sure many of us would love to know how you begin to train for this challenge. Yeah, um, I mean, everybody always asks, Sabrina, how's your training going? And by that question, they're always asking me about the physical training. And there's so much more to it than the physical training. So the first bit of training we did was with Tim, a rowing coach, because neither Leanne and I knew how to row. So first off, we needed to learn how to row. You know, it's important to have technique and, well, just the technique. I think that's really important. You know, even though rowing in a small boat is going to be different than ocean rowing, just how we do that, you know, and if we would work well together. Um, so that came first. Um, and then we originally started off as a team of four women and that changed to a different four. And then it became an emotional roller coaster. And we then hired a 
communication coach, um, Kathy McDonald. Um, so she runs a program now. Her background is Police Scotland and, and a hostage negotiation and crisis management stuff. Um, so she was helping us and still does, um, which has been invaluable. I mean, she's been amazing. And then we've been working with Simon, mindset coach, and making sure our minds are healthy and ready. We have our PT, our nutritionalist. So there's tons of coaching happening all around us. Wow. That, well, that's, that's amazing uh, that you found such a great, a great team to back the great team. Yeah, yeah. The team behind the team is just as important as the team. <laughs> of course, yeah. And um, I was just wondering if you and Leanne are going to be doing any shorter journeys together to get more custom to the boat and each other and also being on the sea versus being in a loft or somewhere else before you go. Yeah, so um, after years of them doing this race, so Talisker originally officially took over in 2013. And every year they do the race, they find out things need to be in place as part of the rules. So part of the rules, and it's mandatory, is that we've done a minimum of 120 hours on our boat before we even get to the start line. If we've not done those hours, they don't even let us to the start line. 24 hours of those need to be darkness. Um, so realizing, you know, Scotland's actually fairly far north and we don't have a lot of darkness in the summer, which is the main time for us to row. We're going to have a fair bit of time um, out on the boat. Um, the idea would be for us to do our evening hours consecutively. So we might just be out on our boat for a week plus at one time um, just to get those hours in. And then you have mandatory things like getting your para anchor out and all sorts of safety things that they need to know that you understand before you even get to the start line. Right, great. Well, I'm going to show you the next picture of the boat. And when I first saw it, I was like, I would fill the cabins and just what I would take away for a weekend, let alone for rowing for several months and and uh all your gear plus four thousand calories a day of food and yes so i have a lot of food that we need to pack I, I can't imagine so you guys ready to see this boat wow <laughs> just incredible incredible so yeah i don't think uh, i i I think that that in itself is a whole thing of how do you pack <laughs> to get everything into that little cabin? <laughs> I've just realized there as well that that's um, an R45 boat. So that boat's for threes, fours, and fives. So you can <gasps> see that there's two spots with where the oars are coming out. And then just ahead of them, you can see that there is a third seated spot. So our boat's actually even smaller than that by four feet. Wow. Wow. And so obviously, well, I'm saying obviously, I imagine there's guidance regarding equipment and the food that you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't even imagine the cost of that as well on top of it all. But it <laughs> must be pretty significant. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're doing it unsupported. Um, so we need to pack for 65 days of food. So for instance, for our, we have so many dry meals, so many wet meals that we need to pack. So mm -hmm. there's two of us in our boat, we'll pack 312 dry meals. We'll pack 78 wet meals and we'll have 130 days worth of snack packs. To, to top up our calories up. Well, it's just under 4,000 each um, calories per day. Wow. And in addition to the boat, how much money do you need to raise to actually get you onto the water to do this challenge? Yeah, so when you you look at everything as a whole, you know, the boat, all of your safety equipment, your foul weather gear, <sighs> just all of our radios, the, the solar panels, the water maker, the oars, we need to take spare oars. 
So just everything in total, the race entry fee, which is kind of also keeps us safe because there's two support boats at either or we're unsupported, but there's a catamaran and a sailboat that will be at the beginning of the fleet and the end of the fleet. But we figure on average, speaking to other teams, about 140,000 pounds to, to do the race in total. Wow, huge. Yes. Absolutely huge. So I just thought I'd share a map with everybody to show where you're going across. Uh, so you're starting in La Gomera in the Canary Islands and you're finishing in English Harbor in Antigua. Um, and just, just to rewind about what you were saying uh, um, about there being no rescue boats. Uh, like, and, and my understanding is that within a few weeks, there can be at least a thousand miles difference between the two, the, with, between the boats. Yes. And uh, a friend of mine did the challenge that you've met, um, Alan, you said that he was, they were out. So they were out for five weeks and they saw the boat once and they, and it wasn't even kind of pulling up beside them going, hi, are you all still alive? And do you need any help? It was like miles away, just a radio call to make sure that they were okay. So, yeah. um, so just to top and to top it off that you're going in the winter months where I would imagine storms can be pretty wicked. Yeah, I mean, the crossing for the Atlantic is quite common to do in kind of December, January, February, um, just because you are hitting the tail end of the storms on the Caribbean side. Um, so it is a really technically a good time to do the, the crossing. We are, we're still in the North Atlantic, but we're hitting the semi-tropics at this point by kind of at that point where we are crossing. So, you know, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. We get enough wind to help us yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't feel like we're rowing through concrete. Um, plus, you know, I hear stories that the surfing, the, the waves is good fun. So fingers crossed. <laughs> well, I, just on the next slide, I just thought I would share with everybody just uh, um, one of the promos that you sent to me um, that I thought we would share. Uh, hopefully it will play. Um, okay. <clears throat> it's, it's not too long. Maybe, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you've muted the sound. Three thousand miles. Two hours on. Two hours on. Twenty-four hours a day. And this is how seven days for the six weeks. Life 
Wow. <laughs> um, come on, slide. So I just thought we would just jump into the charities that you're supporting um, in addition to doing this, uh, the incredible challenge that there's something behind that and it's raising funds for some really awesome charities. And just to mention, if people do wish to, to donate um, for further information, they, they can visit your website for um, um, She Roars. So I just thought maybe we could walk through a few of the, well, all of them briefly, just why you chose to support them. So we'll start off with the Polar Academy. Yes, yeah, so the Polar Academy um, is one of my kind of personal charities that we're rowing for. Um, and when I was tr training and doing the challenge for the Arctic across the Huskies, I met a gentleman named Craig Matheson. And when he was trying to explain to us different survival techniques and different things that we would need out there, um, I learned of his charity, the Polar Academy. And the Polar Academy obviously started in Scotland and it takes the invisible kid ages 14 to 18 and gives them an opportunity of a lifetime. And they get to experience their own kind of polar trek. And they go to Greenland, 10 days, they pull their own sled, they cook their meals, they learn how to protect themselves kind of and set up gated fences for the polar bears. So, you know, they kind of experience the exact same thing I'm experiencing. They learn about the training and the nutrition and a new skill, I cross-country skiing, pulling their own sled. And then, you know, afterwards they have to do public speaking and they have other commitments. So I guess it's a bit like the Duke of Edinburgh and those kind of programs as well, other than you know, it's not just a three day out in the hill camping. They're out there pulling their sled for 10 days and, you know, learning the harsh reality of that Arctic wind and, and snow sometimes. Yeah. And, and, and getting along with each other. And yeah. 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 Um, and I guess myself, you know, realizing, you know, I was that invisible child, that child that dealt with bullying and stuff. I was like, oh, to have that opportunity in high school just would have been amazing. Um, and it, for this magnitude of a challenge, you need to know there's another reason I'm out on the Atlantic and I'm not just doing it for me. I'm doing it for all these kids that get to experience something bigger than, you know, something they might ever get to experience with the Polar Academy, you know, so I need to get to the finish line or I'm not just, you know, going to not be happy. <laughs> I'll be letting all these kids down. Um, so for me, I, I chose the Polar Academy and spoke with Craig about it. And, you know, it's very important to me and um, it's going to be what helps push me across. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful. So we've got another one, which is the Women's Fund for Scotland. Yeah, so the Women's Fund for Scotland was decided as a group when we started off as four. And Women's Fund for Scotland give opportunity to groups and charities that might not necessarily be even considered for funding. Um, so they're able to receive bigger grants of money and then they're able to give smaller groups grants um, and they have tons of things happening um, for women and girls across Scotland, anywhere from um, mountain bike coaching and sporting things to learning how to sew to getting involved in different industry where it's be maybe been male dominant like construction. Um, they've got so many different little charities that they help that they say that they're no more than 50 miles away from a project that they they've helped fund so they've helped fund 956 different charities across Scotland and when I say 50 miles you know when you get further north into the northern part of Scotland it might be 50 miles as the bird flies um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know it's just nice because it's 
thinking of all the smaller community-based things happening. So yeah, I love that. That's that's amazing. Um, and and the final charity is the Mabel Foundation. Is it the Mabel Foundation? It's the Mabel Foundation. Um, and this one's particularly special to Leanne. Um, it's an African charity, and Leanne grew up in South Africa. <clears throat> and the Mabel Foundation helps mainly girls in all parts of Africa against period poverty. So they've set up firstly in Kenya and they're working with the Maasai and they're educating both girls and boys about what it is to have a period and that it isn't taboo because girls can miss up to 20% of their schooling over a month period or a month <laughs> because of their period. Um, so yeah, they're, they're looking at trying to end period poverty. But um, I mean, if we look at everything that's happening in Scotland and we're even still trying to tackle that, you know, if, if we look at big cities like London, like there's a huge problem there. So, you know, we, we have to pick charities. We, I mean, we'd want to do it for everybody, but we can't. Um, so yeah, the Mabel Foundation's extremely um, a heart chosen one by Leanne. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, th thank you very much for sharing that. And just to, to mention again that um, if people are interested in donating, this is the link um, for she roars, she hyphen roars.com for the charities. If you'd like to donate, that would be really wonderful. I'm sure um, large and small is, and small and large uh, <laughs> donations are most appreciated. So I just thought at this stage, we could just, we're, we're almost done, but I thought that it would be really good regarding just very briefly talking us through some top tips that can push, that push you forward, Sabrina, that can also help push us forward too. So the first one was setting small goals to help you achieve the big goal. Yeah, I mean, I think we all realize, you know, the, the steps that that is. Um, but one of the things that comes to mind is um, I rode my bike from Aleph up to Glen Shee, over to Braemar, and then back again. And the climb up to, to Glen Shee, fab. I like hill climbing, you know. <laughs> Heading over to Braemar was a little bit windswept. Got to Braemar, had some food, and on the way back up, Braemar to Glen Shee, we hit a headwind and it was brutal. <laughs> and along the road, you get the snow stakes. Hey, what's like, that? To, um, they're like big poles and it kind of lets you know what the snow level is at. Mm -hmm. So they just look like big poles along the way. And honestly, I was that disturbed by this headwind and the frustration of it that I would be like, right, you know what, Sabrina, you're going to cycle 20 more of the big poles and then you can stop. So I get there and I was like looking ahead. I was like, oh, it's just 20 more. So I count 20. Literally, I'd be like one cycle to the next one, two. <laughs> and I think I was about 45 to get actually back up to Glen Shee and then it's downhill. So it was all fine. <laughs> um, but even just small set goals like that when I'm out on my bike, Yep. can you know just push me to to moving forwards well I'll remember that when uh, because Sabrina is going to be our well not a PT for a full time but just help us at the gym on Wednesday so yeah looks yeah, like that will be helpful yes <laughs> so the next one is fear and anxiety yeah um this is an interesting one um a lot of the time when I'm doing a lot of the stuff, especially in the picture that you see, the bungee jump there, um, <laughs> that was a bit killy cranky um, here in Scotland. You know, I was afraid. <laughs> and I just did it anyway. So a lot of the time I just do this and I feel the fear as I'm doing it. Like, it's not like I try and push the fear to the side. I just 
continue doing what I'm doing, even though there's fear right there whispering in my ear. Um, the anxiety probably helps push me forward because you're just kind of like, oh, I just need to get through this. I just need to get through this. Um, yeah. So I probably use it, the fear and the anxiety to push forward just naturally and excel because you don't want to be stuck in that that state of emotion. Yeah, yeah. So it's to almost to get through it. You have to. Yeah, it's, it, it, to get through it. Yeah, I guess it's just continuing to do it, even though you are fearful. You know, that that bungee jump. I should have given you the video to it. I jump, and it's just silent until that bungee cord took hold of my ankles and made me bounce back up. And then I scream and it's the highest pitched scream that you could imagine, like a five-year-old, just that shrilling voice. And you can just hear all the boys at the top laughing because there was such a delay. There was about a 30 second delay where I was like, oh my God, in my head, I was like, I've not hit the ground, I've not hit the ground. And then you bounce back up and you're like, okay, I can scream now, I'm alive. <laughs> You know, it just looks like you're you're going to jump into branches from this. No, <laughs> no you're you're at the underneath the bridge if I kill a cranky there. <laughs> right. So how how far was um I don't even know how far was the jump down? Like how far did the rope go? Kind of I I I honestly can't remember now. Um it's it's not Hi, if you look underneath the guy's legs, you can see little people standing underneath there. Like it's high oh, enough. Uh -huh. that... <laughs> yeah, I see them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All I can say is head out to kill a cranky and try it. <laughs> so I thought these were really good as well, just about showing up when we're learning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every time you do something, and you're out with your comfort zone. You know, the biggest thing I find is you survive it. And it just makes it easier to get through the next point, next time that you're in that zone of being uncomfortable. You're like, well, I've done it before. I can do it again. And it didn't kill me last time. It's not going to kill me this time kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we took the Polar Academy juniors up to the Ely Chain Walk right. on the Fife Coast. And I've never heard of that. Okay. Um, and there's just big chains that you kind of climb across. And we had, we just took the, the girls, the boys went the following day. There was eight of them. And they hit the first chain. And it's not very far down, maybe a meter and a half. And five of them were at the top in tears, crying. And totally get it. Like, it looks pretty scary. And what you have to say to them is, you're here with three adults. You're all wearing hard hats. Do you think we would let you do something that was going to be dangerous? Like, there's always an element of danger. And once they all finally made it through, it took us an hour to coax them down the first chain. Um, from the campground side but once we got there you know I think that just that that'll have changed them you know p7 going into high school knowing actually I did the Ely chain walk and just to see the pride on their faces and how ecstatic they were afterwards and you kind of learn that each time you stick yourself into a position where you're like I'm afraid of that it's going to push you forwards because you're learning, you're learning what, what your boundaries are and that you're not necessarily, I mean, you know, bungee jumping, people do it all the time. Is there danger to it? Yeah. I went to my chiropractic doctor. I was like, what's this going to do to my spine being a Pilates teacher? And he's like, you'll be fine, Sabrina, you know, so. You'll have the best alignment of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I'm not saying it's all safe because we have fear for a reason, you know, that it, it protects us. But sometimes I think we jump to that fear of it's going to kill us first when actually when we break it down realistically, is it? 
no, it's not. Let me do this safely. How can I do it safely? And you start to problem solve naturally. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I guess that's also kind of part of the, this whole talk as well is about um, stepping outside of that comfort zone. And, and for me, I know pers- personally, I, I struggle a lot with chronic pain and other things. And just, I that I hate it's the fear of being uncomfortable and being in pain and that just always seems to to stop me from pushing myself forward and uh yeah so and pain in in many ways just um physically and mentally you know just just being on this talk tonight this is the first time I've ever done this and it was emotional like for this past day of getting it all together making sure it was running properly has been seeing me going through a panic attack and you know but here we are and you know we've all learned something with it myself included you know so it makes the second one easier and the third one easier (laughs) yeah mostly due to event bright and a little bit of zoom there (laughs) yes Yes. (laughs) So, and that's, you know, embracing it instead of resisting it and just going with the flow, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just learning from mistakes. Yeah. I always think, you know, it's never, you know, mistakes are good. We learn from our mistakes as well. And it, you know, one of the mistakes is when I did the Everest Base Camp Trek, a few of the boys decided that they were going to trek in their kilts. Oh well, they learned very quickly that the glacier underneath reflects the sun. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, <laughs> was it a mistake to hike in the kilts? No, but make sure you have your, like, long underwear on underneath. <laughs> and not to keep you warm, to keep you protected. <laughs> yeah, who would have thought that? Yeah, amazing. And painful, I would imagine, <laughs> for them. <laughs> yeah. Um, And I I love this uh, falling. The failing failing isn't failing. It's a stepping stone. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, is it falling? I put falling. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, indeed. And fake it until you make it. Yeah. I mean, that was my motto when I was younger. Fake it until you make it. Like, just do it. Just do it. And... I think doing that while I was younger made it easier for me just to go back a step there and embrace it instead of resist it. You know, I just embrace the fear and work with it instead of trying to resist it all the time and trying to push it to the back, actually keep it there beside me. It keeps me safe, but it pushes me forwards. Mm, Wow. And I think that's probably the, the the last one here about being authentic and just, yeah. Yeah. Just be yourself, you know. Yeah, indeed. So that, that brings us to the next, which is just what's your own great wall? And what challenge, large or small, do you want to push yourself forward with and step outside of your comfort zone and do? So I thought maybe... Um, it would be great if you wanted to share in the chat just something that you wanted to push yourself forward to to kind of go, oh, I'm going to do this. And it could be anything. Reading a large novel or uh, I was just sharing with um, a couple of people when we came on that I went wild swimming yesterday and it was the first time that I've been in um, uh, in the water other than in the sea in a nice tropical place for 30 years and my fear was the cold and my fear was I love the water but I was um, scared of being cold I was scared of coming out and being cold and it's once again that discomfort instead of pushing myself through which I did and I actually went in twice I loved it so much so yeah yeah so here you are as well just at the Great Wall of China and was it 300 miles that you did? We did about approximately 300K of it. So we really just touched the surface of it. 
And in the picture to the, the, the right there, you can see some of the wall was crumbling away underneath of us or beside us. And yeah, definitely, you know, an experience of a lifetime. Yeah, indeed. <clears throat> and I noticed a wee post come up there about Heather finishing a, a novel she's writing. Go for it. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so I just, as we mentioned before, that the uh, presentation, well, that we're, we're, that we're sponsoring Sabrina at Isle Fiber Water. And we're, we're just so proud to be your sponsor. And I, and I feel personally very blessed to have met you as a, as a friend, and I'm yeah, so yeah. delighted that you came on to, to, to speak with people and hopefully um, people learn stuff. I certainly learned stuff in speaking with you and speaking tonight. And uh, so that concludes our presentation. And um, I think just as I was saying, it's important to mention that your adventure doesn't have to be about rowing the Atlantic and it really can be anything. So uh very briefly we're just gonna i know some of you on here are aware of the water and i thought i would just cheekily maybe if this clicks over um oh it's doing funny things right so just about the water i know some of you tried it but uh we're, ju we're just really proud of it because it's taken three years to develop and that it delivers 100 percent of the recommended prebiotics and 20% of daily fiber in one bottle. And just to mention that we do have an 18% discount that we popped on for uh, until September 4th on Amazon. And if you don't want to buy on Amazon, please direct message us on Instagram or Twitter um, or to me directly and I'll, we'll be happy to fulfill it on our end. So now to our Q&A. Uh, Leslie, do you have any questions to, to start off with? There have been no questions posted, but I do just want to clarify um, for everybody that Heather published her novel in 2015. Oh. She's already had the adventure. Oh, fantastic. Wow. I think there might be another adventure <laughs> underway, Heather. <laughs> So no recorded questions. I think that means the floor is open. Oh, Kelly's got a question. I've got lots of questions. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know we were supposed to type them in. Right. Okay, so this, this I've got lots. Where do I start? Will there be any sort of live stream taking place or any way that you are able to even record or feedback your experience as it's happening live? Yes, yeah, so we will have GoPros on board. Um, we will have satellite service through Garmin, which we can connect to social media. However, everything has to go through Atlantic campaigns before we post. Um, so nothing will be of live feed, okay. but as close to live feed as we can get. So it might okay. just be a day or two delayed if we're getting a signal. And I wonder, will you record even just an auditory? You may be so distracted you can't even think about doing that and too exhausted, but just your own process as it's coming up, because I know you're working with a communication person and it'll be interesting to see what you could record to reflect back on later, because you might forget you're so immersed in the flow. Yeah, um, I think we'll do kind of our own diaries at night on how we're feeling. Um, we are working with a young lad named Tom. Um, and he's going to help us do a documentary on it if we right. get the right kind of footage. Yeah. Right. That's exciting. Uh, I'll let somebody else ask a question, but I've got a few more in case. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Back to you, Kelly. While they're thinking, yes. So I'm really curious about the wet foods versus the dry foods. What okay. Kind of foods? So the dry food is dehydrated food. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a water maker on board, which will desalinate the ocean water. And we'll need to rehydrate food using a uh, jet boil. Mm -hmm. Now it's mandatory for us to take 13 days of wet food. So when you're shopping for dehydrated food, 
say in somewhere like Taizos, um, you'll see that there's portions of food that says ready to eat. So it's already moist, has moisture in it and you can eat it hot or cold. So we need to pack 13 days of this for emergencies because at any point we could lose our water maker or the possibility to cook with our jet boil. Okay, got it. All right, that's interesting. And will you practice eating some of this stuff? I'm sure you did when you went to Everest, but just so you get used to it or would you just stay well clear of it until you have to eat it? No, no, no. Um, First off, we've been doing mini challenges. Um, So last summer I did an endurance challenge. I cycled Inverness down to Gerlocky, which was 90K. At Gerlocky, I swapped my stand-up paddleboard and I paddled 10K down to Neptune's staircase. I then swapped and I ran over to the North Face car park of the Ben. And then I hiked up Ben Nevis and back down again. Good God. And a part of that was to learn what kind of foods, one that I would like to eat when I'm in a state of fatigue, because we're rowing two hours on, two hours off, 24 Mm. hours a day Mm. for over six weeks. Um, And interesting, I'm a real kind of sweet tooth and everything I craved was very savory and salty, you know, to get those electrolytes Mm. into my body. Mm. Um, So one, it's getting to know where our taste buds are going to be. And then two, dehydrated food is not so easy on your digestive system. Um, So it'll be really important, especially the three months build up to before we leave La Gomera, that we've put it into our system and it's easier for us to digest. Manage it. Got it. Yeah. You need, I would imagine you need a lot of liquid to help that digestion. And so you need a lot of water, fresh water. water. Yeah. Right. So we have a minimum of 10 liters a day that we need to consume or have Mm -hmm. ready, um, while we're rowing as well. So. Okay. so this brings me to another question. What goes in must come out. Yes. So how do you manage that? Yes, uh, <laughs> it's a bucket. Yeah. Just, yeah, figured maybe a bucket. But okay. like, could you jump, will you have time to jump overboard to get a wee wash and then jump back into the boat or is, are you completely confined to the boat the whole time? Yeah, so we are required by the rules of the race to always be strapped to the boat. So as soon as we walk out the hatch door um, of either the bow or stern cabin, we are connected and tethered onto the boat by a safety line. Um, If we want to go for a swim, you know, it's possible as long as the weather's right. So, you know, there's only two of us in our boat and there's no way we can go back for somebody, you know. Yeah, so you, you need to be able to, to be able to swim to the boat. We have a few things. One, we'll wash and swim. Um, two, as we cross the Atlantic, barnacles will grow on the underneath of our boat. Yeah, so really even though we have an anti-fouling kind of material that's underneath the boat, we still need to go underneath and scrape the barnacles. Mm-hmm. A week's worth of barnacles can slow us down. What did they say? One nautical mile or no um, I'd have to look up the facts on this but technically it slows you down a week's worth of rowing because they create so much drag so I can find that out but yeah we need to scrape the barnacles off the boat too yeah that's that's quite important and just two more quick questions um right so when you personally have done your challenges and you reach that wall where you think I just can't do this anymore where do you dig within yourself? What do you summon? You know, do you do a breathing technique or is there something, or is it just your previous experiences that get you through? Is there something? Yes. Yeah, so this is where to? I, I go to the small goals, like on the bike, you know, so I find something to focus on. Sometimes it's breathing. Um, I could probably do with a bit more breathing technique before I rode the Atlantic. That's for sure. Um, but it's, it's just setting myself smaller goals. So, um, it wasn't maybe as much of a problem when I was doing the great wall or the Atlantic challenge, but the Arctic one is like, okay, I can see where the next kind of person is. I just need to get to that point. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, I can see the tree line. If I could just get to the tree line. So yeah. you just, instead of trying to get to the destination, you just make your destination a smaller point and then you just add another one and another one. I, that's where I have to dig. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. You just break it right down to what's right in front of you. Yeah, and then, you know, from a psychological point of view as well, it's kind of, it, it, it's just making all the pieces smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of psychological, I know you're working with Kathy and I know you and your friend are close. They're yeah. doing the rowing together, but she's coaching you on how you can manage that process as two individuals confined for six weeks in a small space. And yeah, so well, something Kathy, like this before with just one other person where you've had to. Yeah. So Kathy's helping us learn and work better communication effectively and you know there's going to be lots of high stress points while we're crossing there's no doubt about it Leanne also has two small children um so you know I have to be respectful to the emotions that she's going to go through and it's how to either one give each other space and knowing when that's time for that and when to help kind of push the other one through so like um I've decided I'm going to hide a bunch of little mini treats on the boat for Leanne like I know she likes biltong and a few other kind of South African things yeah. and I mean she's not online tonight so she won't know um, <laughs> don't share the recording right <laughs> really, really in a kind of state then you know I'll have something that I can help you know hopefully reflect on something more positive instead of getting stuck in that negative way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope she does the same for you. I think so. <laughs> and, and final question. Do you get any whiskey if you win this thing or if you finish it? <laughs> that would be a motivator for me. But... I'm, I'm pretty sure they give you a whiskey miniature. Uh, Perfectly anyway. along the ride, but hey. Wow. I would hope you get a little bit more than that. <laughs> oh Yeah. I think it's personal. Take the miniatures, hide the miniatures on the boat, I should say, would be a nice little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's it. Sorry, so many questions. But no, I'm just, I just love that you're doing this. I think it's incredible. Oh, well, well thank, thank you, you so much, I Kelly. I have a boat to sell after if you fancy it. <laughs> you sure we couldn't live on it or take it somewhere for a ride? Or maybe we could rent it out for people who want to do the challenge. There you go. Boat. Charge boat. them a lot. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> That would be fun to do, actually. <laughs> yeah. You could do your own, your own challenge. Yeah. Roar with me. Roar. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Oh, I can't see the chat. Uh, were, there, were there any other questions that people had? Oh, Debbie's got one. We've got two questions. <laughs> right. Go ahead, Debbie. Oh, well, Debbie's asked if we're going to take some aisle fiber water with you. So probably not because I don't think you've got a lot of space. <laughs> yes. So we have to pack. Now it, it's changing now because we have a brand new built boat that will take possession of hopefully at the end of September. But traditionally we used to have to take a minimum of 50 liters of emergency water. So we do need to take water with us. They prefer it to be in one liter bottles. Um, and it gets packed into the bottom. It used to be kind of your ballast water. So when you capsized, it'd bring you back up and round because the, the bottom of the boat would be the heaviest. Um, the likelihood is we will just take regular still water, not our IO fiber water. Um, if there was a way we could take the IO fiber water where it wasn't individual bottles, possibly we'd consider maybe putting it into a water bladder for the first week thereafter you know all of the water that we are drinking is desalinated through our water maker mm -hmm. you know so we don't want to weigh our boat down our boat on its own weighs 1200 kilos and that's before we've packed it with anything yeah yeah, yeah. if Definitely. you can it would be great to take one bottle and a picture <laughs> of course of course yes <laughs> Or even just a, you know, maybe a couple stashed just as a wee treat to surprise, exactly. you know. Exactly. Because it is fiber. So it is, you know, you're giving yourself something. What, what if all the water went 
you know, often you just have fiber water floating there and saves your life. I can see, yeah. them. I can see them writing a film about this. So, sorry. Uh, uh, Heather's just asked, what do you do about needing, uh, meeting smaller goals when you're in the middle of the ocean? There's not going to be any landmarks to work for. Is it dinner? <laughs> that was a great question. Mine was, was it dinner? <laughs> so the, the smaller goals. Um, I mean, what we're learning is that we need to be everything on the boat. We need to be the electrician. We need to be the plumber. We need to be, you know, the joiner. <laughs> we have to navigate. We need to do it all. Um, so the smaller goals I think we'll set for ourselves will be distance, you know, right. Today we've got headwinds. Do we stick pair anchor on, which is a parachute anchor and save our energy? Or do we push forward and you know, every nautical mile we make a goal or every 20 nautical miles we'll make a goal or, you know, if we hit the big 40 foot waves, you know what? We've learned how to surf waves. Let's see how many more waves we can hit. Great, we've just done 30 waves, you know. So you would find something else that would become your smaller goal. I actually have a question. Um, so... Are you going to bring things like a Kindle or something to read to relax? Or do you think that you are going to be just so exhausted you will crawl into the cabin and crash? Yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, some teams have ended up stuck in cabins for 78 hours because the weather does not permit them to be out rowing. There's no point rowing when you're going to be rowing backwards. So you might as well save your energy and get some sleep. Um, yes, I think we'll take a tablet with books and possibly films or whatever we can on there. Whether or not we use it or not, I don't know. We were discussing about um, <laughs> trying to learn a few different languages and being so you know, bilingual by the time we get to the end. <clears throat> and speaking with your friend, Alan, he's like, it's the last thing. You just don't have the mental capacity to try that because you're so fatigued within the first three days between seasickness, two hours on, two hour off shifts. So it's going to probably for me be music, you know, because I can just switch off to music and I can keep pushing forwards, but not have a lot of the mental side of it taken up with that. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, does it, Does anybody have any other questions or can I ask another one? <laughs> can I say something, Elisa? Of course, Caroline. Oh. Um, um, I just, you mentioned earlier, um, Sabrina, about the um, Duke of Edinburgh. Um, some of the kids did that. I'd just like to say that my son did that. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh -huh, he did that. I can't remember where he sailed but he had to do all of the cooking and the cleaning and going up the what do you call the the sail hoisting the sail and things like that he had to do all of that um and one of the questions that i was you know i was thinking was about how when you when the fear really does kick in you know, how do you, how are you going to be able to do that? But you mentioned that you're getting some coaching through your breathing techniques and things like that. Would these kids, you know, that, that do that sort of thing, would they have been able to? Because I don't remember my son having all of that at that time. Okay, I know so that's... Sorry. I mean, yeah, you know, it, I think that's very individual for the child, one. You know, I mean, for some children to go up to the top of the mast and disconnect things and having that fear of heights is going to possibly paralyze them, whereas some are just quite happy to, to climb up that and do that. I mean, I think a lot of that can be within our own kind of personalities and our mm. our own yeah. kind of dynamic. Mm. Um it would be interesting to see what all of the kids thought that were on that expedition. Um, quite amazing that they got to sail. That's a pretty cool expedition, in my opinion. 
Um, well, it's very interesting because I'm going to find out who, you know, who, because you chose that Polar um, charity. So I'm going to find out who, if they had a charity at that time. Yes. So the other question, the other question I was, oh, yeah, I was going to ask, um, you mentioned that um, when you when you got the parasite, um, did you have intestine, intestine problems that hampered any sort of training, you know, or activities? Were you in pain with the parasite? And now you found iofiber water, which is giving you all of, you know, your fiber and, and, you know, your gut biome and all of that. Compare that now, compare your gut now to having the parasite. How, what is the difference? Yeah, yeah. So I have no idea when I picked up the parasite in India. What I do know is that I was having digestional kinds of yeah. stuff happening. So what would happen is I'd be going through kind of constipation to diarrhea, kind of this influx. But I was in India, you know, I was eating all sorts of new foods, not worrying about that, you know, going for a fresh chai from, you know, the street vendor. I was going whitewater rafting in the Gang Ganges. Do you know what I mean? Like it could have been from anywhere. Um, and what normally happens is you get that vomiting and like the vomiting side of things. And I didn't get that. I just got this influx until I probably got back to the UK where it was a more sterile environment. And then I couldn't hold anything down. I vomited for about two and a half months, oh even God. with the <laughs> antibiotic. So at this point I'd had two, two months plus then continued through the summer on antibiotics, which means I had no good bacteria left in my body whatsoever. Jeez. So then for the next year, once they were like, right, we've gotten rid of the parasite and it's, um, I wish I could remember the word of it. It's an. Oh, you sent it to me. Yeah, it's a cyst, no, an, no, an, a nymphocyte yeah. that it creates in the system. And for the, year after I kind of got it out of my system I just had bad stomach cramping like it was a little bit like IBS like if I had to use the toilet I had to go then and there yeah. I then started a cocktail after working with the nutritionalist on just different things to help the small intestine of my system but what was happening is I'd stick the probiotic in and I wasn't taking enough prebiotic to help create a culture of it. So if I wasn't taking the probiotic, then what would happen is I could feel the digestive system not working proper. So, you know, uh, most of the time mine was more constipation. And then what happens is the body wants to push it through rid of all the heat that it's creating. So I was getting stuck in this cycle of, you know, not wanting to always have to take supplements. And I would try three weeks without it. And for them to do a stool sample, you have to stop it for three weeks anyway to get the most accurate. So then you get out of routine of taking everything. So it wasn't until I started taking the, the fiber water and I forget, I, I decided I wanted to work with the GP locally because I paid for it all originally. And I was like, oh, two weeks in, I'm still feeling okay. And then when I got the test results back and they could show that I didn't have these cysts and lymphocyte things in my system, you, you, you can start to feel the difference, definitely. Now what I'm finding is I still need to help my system out. I still need to take the probiotic and the prebiotic. The flora within my gut, still not 100%, but I can definitely feel that the change is happening. Great. That it's starting to become this in hostile, more of a hostile environment that it can, you know, work proper and, you know, feel better. Feel That's why I'm so impressed that you're doing all this in the face of everything you've experienced. It's extraordinary. I think, I don't know, I think when we talked once about it, you kind of, are the type of person who just 
throws your line out there and scrambles to kind of keep up in a way. You don't think about the obstacles too much. You just, you said it was a way for yeah, you to just worry about the obstacle when I get to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're not sitting there dwelling on why you can't yeah. do it. You're just thinking about the benefit of yeah. doing it or you just make that decision, don't you? You just decide, well, I'm just going to do it. And then you'll worry about how you get there. In the process. Yeah, and then I end up telling certain people, and then pride gets in the way, and I was like, I have to do it now. <laughs> exactly, you box yourself in. I'm a bit like that. I get that. Wow. I, I think that in itself is quite amazing because for me, I create the obstacles before I've even started the challenge. I've created the obstacle of I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to be in discomfort. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. So I actually talk myself out of things before I even take that step forward. Yeah. You know, well, so. what is it? They say that um, as far as commitment, that 99% is a bitch, but 100% is a breeze. So you just decide. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I did Sunday, jumping into the water, right, Caroline? And you loved it. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Wow. One question for you, though. Will Talisker have some sort of a way for us to track your progress as it's happening so we can follow you? Yeah. So yeah. Um, Talisker is the headline sponsor. The company that runs the race is called Atlantic Campaigns. And they have this thing on the social media. It's called dot watchers. So as a whole, you can dot watch, but closer to the race time, what I what I do, and if you follow on social media or the website, is we give you the app details of the tracker, and you put our team name in. You'll see all of the teams um, that are in the race, but it'll let you know where we are, and, and you'll see. They'll give us each a color um, and you can, you know, point up, like click on us on your app and, and follow us all the way. So if, for instance, we all hit a storm and you see our boat pointing backwards because it's a triangle, then you know that we're, we're either rowing backwards <laughs> or we're on <laughs> anchor and we're not going anywhere. Okay. All right. mm-hmm. That's exciting. So you can track us the whole time. Yeah. yeah. You'll def- definitely need to. I, I, so can we... So on your website, is there a way we can sign up and be apprised of things that are happening? Or is it better that you just let us know once this is all up and running? I don't think it's the best way. Yeah, we're still 14 months away. um, So, you know, things might change. um, But the best way to do it is on the Facebook social media Mm -hmm. um, because they have a group called the Dot Watchers. And if you have any questions while we're crossing, like, why does it look like, so sometimes a team will look like they're in first place on the map, yeah. but they're not, they'll be in second place because yeah. they've gone further south. So they're further away from the final destination point. Right. And you can ask questions like that. Like one boat might come up in gray and it'll look like, look like it's dissolving. And they'll be like, why is such and such a boat gone gray? And it's because they've lost satellite connection and the, the satellite is with, been I think four hours away from picking up their last signal so you get to ask as many questions as you want you know and it's very interactive and you're interacting with the safety team itself fantastic so it's a staggered start though so whoever finishes first isn't necessarily in first is that right yes the timing thing yeah yeah and you know what there's usually I've seen three teams come in in the same day within a few hours of each other, but we don't set off within hours of each other. You yeah. literally are spaced out about three minutes. All oh, right, that close. And, and you don't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> you might see that two boats are within one nautical mile of each other, but they, those two boats can't see each other. They can see mm-hmm. each other on their navigation system, but they can't actually physically see the other boat. Gotcha. So there's going to be lots for each other. To deal with. What was that? Sorry. I was just wondering if you'd be in touch with each other as well on radio if you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Although there'll be a huge space between you, I would imagine, quite quickly. And you know, teams. The the ocean rowing community is actually proving to be really fun. You know, there's already a lot of banter going on. There'll be a lot of banter while we're crossing and. You know, 
motivating each other, but psyching each other out as well. <laughs> and, and do you know how many two person votes there are as opposed to say three or four or whatever? So um, there are 49 votes going out at the mm -hmm. moment in 2023 when we're racing. And 18 of those votes are pairs. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of pairs. Mm -hmm. No, that's solo and pair. I think uh, 11 of those are, oh, I have to go and check again, Kelly, now. <laughs> okay, that's okay. But there's, yeah, there's Following a the number, but not a huge number. So you're... half of the fleet is pairs and solos. The other half is trios, quads, and fives. Gotcha. So there's a lot of solos and pairs going out. Um, to date, there have been 12 female pairs that have ever gone east to west on this crossing. Um, so only 12 female pairs with two teams to go this year. And then there's three female pairs teams in 2023 at the moment. So it depends if we all get to the start line. You know, we're confident that we will, but there's already a few teams just with whatever, you know, everything that's happening with the war and cost of living, it's, it's a big, huge expense. So some teams are already putting their race back to about 2025 because 2023 right. is full and 2024 is full. Wow. wow. Yeah. So how many women here are going to sign up for 2025? Raise your hand. <laughs> Well, Debbie, I have a vote that will have done one crossing. <laughs> I want to be in your boat. Okay. Anyway. I, I have one, one question, perhaps, unless anybody else has one. Um, we can uh, finish for the evening. And are you going to have a launch party when you get your boat? Yes. Um, I think we'll do different things across Scotland. You know, we want Scotland involved. There's a few mixed teams that go and they tend to be mixed kind of from across the whole nation mm -hmm. um so the idea is we get our boat and we try and get scotland to help name our boat because the scots like to name things like snow gritters and i already know bodie mcboat face is that's taken so <laughs> that's my that's friend well, that <laughs> is <the main> day. <laughs> um so yeah no we really want to just get the whole nation involved like scotland um yeah. it's interesting because yeah. neither leanne and i are scottish <laughs> well we are because we're both dual nationals and we are very much um if you go onto the website you'll see a lot of the teams registers uk uk and we've specifically registered as scotland um yes. as our country um so she's south african i'm canadian by birth, um, but we are registered as Scottish because we both have that. You gotta have a little tartan something or a Scottish flag on the boat. Tartan on the boat somewhere, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Fantastic. Just what's the date you leave? It's December next year, right? Yeah, um, so the proposed date right now is December 12th. Um, oh. The only thing that changes that is usually the weather. Um, there has been chat um, because there are mo so many pairs and solos that they might send the pairs and solos out five days earlier <clears throat> because it's 50. They've never had 50 boats go out ever. And what that means is the solos and pairs get out and then they get caught up by the trios, quads and fives, possibly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but right now, the 12th of December is the official start date of our race. Right. Well, there's going to be a big party on the when you arrive at the other shore. Which in Antiva. Leave at Lagomera, right? So yeah, that's what I was just going to ask there. Look are our you hotels now. To, yeah, are you allowed to come and see you set off? Yes, or? 100%. Yeah. Um, so Lagomera is quite a small island. Um, you fly into the South Island or the South End of Tenerife, and then you get a ferry across. I think there are some small planes that go into La Gomera. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, the more at the start line, the better. Let's um, go. It's just <laughs> I think we should all go. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? There and then are fly over to your end oh. destination at the, at the other it's, time. Um, it's a small island and there's 50 teams. Um, so I would book it sooner rather than later. 
or I would book South Tenerife and then know that you've gotten the ferry that morning that the race sets off. Right. Wow. How are you getting the boat there, Sabrina? We ship the boat. Um, so we're hoping to pick up our boat at the end of this uh, end of September. And then unfortunately, we're going to be stuck with the winter months, which ideally mid-Atlantic would be fine. Um, but we're mm-hmm. North Atlantic and a lot of our training will be coastal, um, which makes it very dangerous for us, makes it very dangerous for the boat. So the likelihood is we will get out onto some of the Scottish locks while the weather is calmer and we can practice rowing her. (laughs) And then come spring, that's when we really need to get our training in gear because we have 120 hours to get in minimum um, and a lot of it's still coastal. Um, So we do just need to, yeah, it'll give us a chance to learn how to use our radio and let the ferries know and the rigs know and all of that that we're out there as well. And I think it's important to mention that this is a really expensive undertaking for you guys and you're doing it on behalf of other people as well as yourself, but it's, yes. you know, it's a big, big expense. So anything that anybody can contribute probably is going to be a help financially. Is that right? Yeah. So we've been using um, our boat as a billboard really, because there's a huge global media connection to this. Um, so we've been lucky. We've had things, um, smaller companies. Um, we get a lot of startups, actually. We have IO, IO Fiberwater, um, Face and Beauty by Laura Porter. So a lot of startup companies have been really drawn to our team specifically. But then we have the old, you know, ones that have been in Scotland for a long time, Tunnex. They were on board quite wow. quickly, you know, and kind of probably gave us a false <laughs> sense of uh, <laughs> how easy it was going to be. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a push, definitely. Yeah, About four weeks ago, we thought we were going to lose our boat to a different team because we just hadn't come up with the funds yet. Oh, God. Right, so, so there's a GoFund page or something here. That Have you got that link? Yeah, so we've got um, the easiest thing would be to go through the website. So it's okay. www.she-roars.com. Okay. And then there's a donate button on there. So, you know, you just go and that will take you directly to the GoFundMe page. I've also got it here for the donation with GoFundMe. Good stuff. (laughs) So exciting. Yeah, we have like fun different things happening with with it. Like we're saying three pounds dedicate a song because both of us know that you know, music's going to be a big thing of helping us through. So you get to dedicate the song. We'll put up the song. If you allow, we'll put anonymous otherwise who's dedicated the song. And, That's you know, we'll put together a playlist that way. Um, mm-hmm. Feed the crew at 25 pounds. That feeds us our three meals. Um, we've got a stowaway package. So you get your name printed on the boat. It's not massive, but, you know, it's your name on the boat. And then we have our 250 club, our 500 club, which gets your logo on the cabin, on the boat. So when we're filming while we cross, oftentimes we'll catch that logo. And then we have the bigger logos and the bigger sponsorship packages using our boat like the billboard. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Yes. What a great opportunity for some businesses. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yay. Oh, I'm so proud of you. This is great. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> Wow. Well, is there any other questions? Are we happy to wrap up? Anyone? Well, I just want to thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to to share about what you're doing, Sabrina, and what you have done, and uh, and also to embrace IO Fiber Water. And uh, I'm just delighted that it's making a difference for you, as it has been with many people. So. Thank you so much. And yay. yay. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for the invite um, to, to do this. And thank you everyone for joining us. I think we should do it again though and have you back, Sabrina, because you're going to need to keep fundraising because there's going to be unexpected things and lots of stuff. So would you come back? Because it's lovely. I think it's great to have you. Yeah, you know, it could be fun to, to maybe get uh, Leanne on with me as well. Yeah. Um, have us coming live from our boat so we could talk you through and show you the boat and you know the water maker and I'm all the electrical your boil. your yeah. jet boil sounds phenomenal <laughs> i'd love to know more about that 
Jet yeah, foil is just a canister of gas. Right. With a cup that screws on and you boil it and it's got um, a neoprene cover on it and it just boils up. Well, okay. That's it. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much on behalf of everyone. And uh, thank you. And have a wonderful evening, everyone. And we will catch up soon and keep you posted about what's going on for She Roars. Yeah, I love it. I love the name. Uh, thank you my, my sister tuned in so hi jane she's, uh, she's on as mary but i call her jane well, hi sweetie i don't want to show us your face she's probably not going to do that but anyway she's in california so oh, you might be getting some californian support you never know lovely <laughs> fantastic right well right. on that note everyone have a lovely evening and right. thank you again take bye. care love bye. you bye, bye. 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 <laughs>